Today, we'll be identifying the machines we'll use in our room and what they are used for. When I refer to machines we'll be using in this room, I mean devices that help us sand, drill holes, and cut. And they are powered by electricity. They are plugged into the wall. So as you can see, this first machine is a drill press. And this drill press is indeed plugged into the wall. Machines always have an on off switch. They may look different, but there's always a start and a stop button. In this case, our drill press has a push button start and stop. This drill press drills holes in wood and it does that with this drill bit right here. What you do is you lower the drill bit and the drill bit as it's spinning drills holes into the wood. Let me show you what I mean. drill bit spinning. This handle right here is used to lower the drill bit. Drill bit goes down, 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 down. And it drills into your wood and drills a hole into your wood. Next, let's look at the scroll saw. This is one of the scroll saws in our room. The scroll saw is used to cut wood. So while the drill press drilled holes in wood, the scroll saw cuts wood. It cuts wood using this blade right here. Again, this scroll saw is a machine and it is powered by electricity. So it's plugged into the wall. And just like all machines, it's going to have an on off switch. They may look different, but in this case, we have a toggle switch. So it toggles on and off. You're going to notice that when I turn this scroll saw on, that this blade right here on the front side is where it cuts and it's going to go up and down like a sewing machine needle. And as you pass your wood, through that blade, it'll cut your wood. Last but not least, the third machine we're going to use in this room is a belt sander. Again, all machines in this room are powered by electricity, so they're plugged into the wall. This belt sander sands wood. So it has this belt right here that's made of sandpaper and that's going to sand away wood. And it sands away a lot of wood in a very little amount of time. Of course, this machine also has an on off switch. All of our belt sanders are the same. If you go to the right side, you'll see a toggle switch. And if you toggle it up, up, it's going to make the belt move. The belt's going to move in a downward direction and when you put your wood into the belt it'll sand it. So I'm just going to turn it on and show you how the belt moves. I'm going to walk through all the different machines in the room and you're going to try to identify them as a drill press, a scroll saw, or a belt sander. Here's the first machine that you'll encounter if you turn left upon first entering the room. It has an on-off switch. It has a handle that you spin to move down a drill bit. What machine is this? Here's your three choices. If you said drill press, you are correct. Let's move to the second, the second machine in our room. Again, it has an on off switch. This one's different. This is a toggle switch that you have to push up instead of the push button switch on the first one we saw. But it has a handle that you spin to move a drill bit down. 
Is it a drill press, a scroll saw, or a belt sander? If you said a drill press, you're correct. Let's look at this third machine in our room. Can you identify this machine? Again, an on-off switch, a handle that moves a drill bit down. What simple machine is this? If you said a drill press, you're correct. Let's move to a fourth machine in the room. It has the on off switch down here. Looks like a light switch. You just push it up to turn it on. And it has a blade. Can you tell me which machine this is? A drill press, a scroll saw, or a belt sander? If you said scroll saw, you're correct. Our next machine, again, it has the switch down here, looks like a light switch, switch, push it up to turn it on, and it has a blade. Is this a drill press, a scroll saw, or a belt sander? Yes, it's a scroll saw. Again, another simple machine in our room. This one has a toggle switch but it has the blade, which simple machine, pardon me, not simple machine, which machine is this? A drill press, a scroll saw, or a belt sander? If you said scroll saw, you're correct. Let's move on. Here we have a switch on the side, a toggle switch that you pull up to turn on, and it has a belt. Which simple machine is this? A drill press, a scroll saw, or a belt sander? If you said belt sander, you're correct. How about this machine? If you said belt sander, you're correct. Moving on along. And this is another, yes, belt sander. Let's move along. Here we have a machine that has a toggle switch and a blade. Which machine is this? If you said scroll saw, you're correct. Here we have a push button on off switch and a drill bit. Which machine is this? If you said drill press, you're correct. This machine we're not going to use. We're going to pass right by it. Here is another machine. It has a push button start and stop. It has something to hold a drill bit in it, but the drill bit is missing. Can you identify which machine this is? Drill press, scroll saw, or belt sander? If you said drill press, you're correct. One last machine that we'll be, we will not be using in this room. So let's learn in more detail about the drill press. We learned that the drill press is plugged in. It's powered by electricity. It has some type of an on off switch, in this case, two push buttons. It has a handle that you spin to move a drill bit down, which drills holes in the wood. The drill bit itself determines what size hole that you're going to drill into the wood. And it's all based on the diameter of the hole that it's going to drill. So right here, this shows the diameter of a hole, how much the measurement between one side to the other. And if it's a small drill bit, then it's going to drill a small hole. In this case, this is a 1 8 inch drill bit, which means that this measurement right here, the diameter would be 1 8 inch. If you look over here to this drill bit, this is a much larger one, so this is going to build, drill a much larger hole. So anytime you're drilling a hole and if you're drilling through two pieces of wood, you always want to tape the wood together 
So you can drill both of them at the same time. And that's what I've done here. So this is an example of a seventh grade part to a catapult. And I wanna drill the hole right here and right here. So I tape the two parts together. Here's an example of two supports for an eighth grade project. And again, I wanna drill the hole right here, but since I wanted to go through both pieces, I've taped them together first. This is a jig, and this is a self-centering jig, meaning that anything I put in this jig, if I squeeze these two sides together, the drill bit is going to go right through the center when we're looking at the depth. So the amount of space on this side of the drill bit is the same as the amount of space on this side of the drill bit. So the hole will be centered depth-wise. And then we can move it back and forth to place the hole along the width. So I'm going to put a thicker piece of wood in. This is a seventh grade piece of wood. And if I squeeze these two pieces together, again, you can see that the drill bit is centered depth wise. Let's drill the eighth grade piece of wood first. So this is our supports. As you can see, we're drilling the hole right here. So step one is we have to put the piece in and squeeze tight so that it centers the wood. Then we want to line this up to where the drill bit is. Next, we wanna squeeze these pieces together. See how I'm doing? Squeezing them together and hold the piece of wood down while keeping my fingers away from the drill bit. Right now, I am dangerously close to the drill bit. This is not safe. What could I do to this piece of wood so that I could still hold it down while not keeping my fingers close to the drill bit? Any ideas? Yes, we can just swap it around this way. So again, I'm going to squeeze this together and line up my hole on my drill bit squeeze my wood together and hold it down with my hand, my finger. Squeeze together so it's centered, hold it down with my finger. Now I'm far enough away from the drill bit, so I'm not going to potentially get caught by the drill bit, but I'm going to be able to hold the wood down. Now the question is, why am I holding the wood down? I know why I'm, why I'm using this jig. I'm using this jig so that I can center the hole depth-wise. But why am I holding it down with my finger? Let me tell you. So when you turn on, right here, when you turn on the, the drill press, you're going to notice that the drill bit spins around in a circle. And when you bring it down, it's going to go deep into your wood and it's going to grab onto your wood. And it's going to penetrate the wood all the way through. Then you're going to have to bring the drill bit back up. And when you're bringing the drill bit back up, it's going to still grab onto this wood. So it's going to remove the wood from your jig and make it rise up. And the drill bit is going around in a circle. So if this happens, if this rises up with the drill bit, it's going to start wildly spinning like this. That's what we wanna prevent. That's unsafe. So there's two ways to be unsafe with this drill press. One is have your finger too close to the drill bit because this is spinning around and it can cut you. For example, like this, we wanna keep it, you know, a couple inches away Second is to not hold it down on this piece of wood, down, pressing down. If you don't do that, it'll rise up with your drill bit when you raise up your drill bit and it's going to spin wildly. So I'm going to show you an example of me drilling. Before I do anything, of course, I'm putting on my safety glasses to keep any dust or debris out of my eyes. Then. I'm making sure that my sleeves are rolled up past my elbows. 
I'm tying any, my hair back if it's long. I'm tucking in any necklaces or strings or ties that could potentially get caught in this drill bit. And when I feel that I'm all safe, then I'm going to start. So step one, you're going to put your piece of wood in between these two pieces and close it. Step two, you're going to line up where you want to drill your hole. So just move this wood accordingly. Step three, you're going to squeeze these pieces tight so that we know that this hole will be centered depth wise and hold it down with my finger, with your finger. Step four, you're going to turn it on. Press the start button. You're going to take your hand and start lowering the drill bit with your right hand. And you're going to go all the way down and you, you can't go down anymore. As you can see, this stop right here prevents you from going any further. I can't go any further. This is where it starts to get dangerous. It's going to, this piece of wood is going to want to rise up once you start raising your drill bit. So here's my hand. I'm going to start allowing the drill bit to go up. And this piece of wood is going to want to rise up with the drill bit unless you're using this finger to press it down. Squeezing these two pieces of wood together, holding the piece of wood down, let it rise up. Press the stop button. Allow for this drill bit to stop spinning, and then we can remove our wood. And it's drilled right through and it's centered. Next, we're going to drill the seventh grade piece of wood. To drill my seventh grade piece of wood, again, since I want to drill through both of these pieces, I've taped them together. going to put the piece of wood in my jig and squeeze the sides closed. I'm going to slide this down where I need to drill. Let me ask you your opinion. Is this a good idea? I hope you said no. My finger is dangerously close to the drill bit. So what could I do instead? I could flip my wood around and now I can be safe. I'm going to squeeze this piece of wood with my left hand. Even if you're not left-handed, you're going to squeeze this piece of wood with your left hand. In this case, it's a little different. Instead of holding it down with my finger, I can just press with the palm of my hand. I'm squeezing it together and pressing with the palm of my hand. I'm going to turn this on. Start. I'm going to start bringing the drill bit down. go all the way until I can't go anymore. Can't go anymore. Now, this is where my piece of wood is going to want to rise up with my drill bit. So this is where I really have to start pressing down with my left hand. I'm going to let the drill bit rise up. Pressing down with my left hand. And then press stop. Wait for the drill bit to stop and now I can remove my piece of wood. And if it gets a little splintered like that, it's just fine. And that's all there is to using the drill press. Now we're going to use our scroll saw. The scroll saw, as we know, cuts wood using this blade. This presser foot right here needs to be high enough so I can pass my wood through. As you can see, this presser foot is not tall enough. Let me move on to another scroll saw to see if one is taller. This presser foot has been adjusted so my piece of wood can slide under it. Perfect, that's just what I need. As we spoke about before, when you turn on the scroll saw, the blade's going to go up and down. And the blade's going to wanna to grab onto your wood as it's cutting. And as the blade is going up and down and grabbing onto your wood, it's going to want to make your wood bounce and go up and down. This is dangerous. So you do not want your wood to wildly be bouncing as you're cutting. You will not have control of it. So the best way to hold down your wood so that it doesn't bounce 
is to press it firmly down on the table. I know I'm pressing hard enough if I can feel it in the muscles of my triceps. That's the upper arms in the back. If you can feel that muscle working, then you're pressing down hard enough. You need to press down on the table as you're bringing it into the wood. As you can see, here's the gray area right here that's shaded in. I'm going to cut right in between that for now. So of course, I'm going to follow all safety rules. I have my safety glasses on. I have my hair pulled back if it's long. I have anything that's dangly tucked into my shirt, like um, the ties on a hooded sweatshirt or a tie if I'm wearing one or a long necklace or a bracelet on my wrist. And I'm again, rolling up my sleeves to my elbow. When you use this machine, first of all, you always want to determine where you want to cut and then back up your piece of wood just a little bit away from the blade. So you never want to start it with the blade touching your wood because if you can hold on to this piece with two hands, that would be the best case scenario. But as you can see, I have to release my hand to turn it on. And meanwhile, this blade will start cutting my wood. So I'm going to back it up before I even start. Every single scroll saw has a round plate. One might be a little bigger than the other, as in the diameter. One might be a different color than the other, but it has a round plate. This is important. We want to keep our fingers outside of the round plate. In other words, this would be dangerous. My fingers are inside the round plate, but this is safe. My fingers are outside the round plate. This is going to keep our fingers far enough away from the blade. And as you know, the blade can obviously cut us. So just like the drill press, we want to keep our fingers away from any parts that can cut us. And in this case, it's the blade. If I take my fingers and put them way outside, you might think that you're being even more safe than just outside of the circle. But you're not. Because another problem with using the scroll saw that can create an unsafe condition is if this starts bouncing and you have more control to prevent this from bouncing if, you're if your fingers are closer to the blade. So if you keep your fingers just outside the round plate and press down, you're going to be able to keep enough control to press down hard enough to stop it from bouncing while still keeping your fingers a safe enough distance away from the blade. So let's practice. I'm going to decide where I wanna cut it. In this case, I wanna cut right in between the shaded area then I'm going to back it up a little and I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to keep my fingers just outside of the round plate. Don't put your thumbs inside by accident. That's a common mistake. Be most aware of where your thumbs are. That's where people will forget and put them inside the round plate area. So even my thumbs are outside. I'm pressing down on the wood. I can feel it in my triceps. I'm slowly bringing it in. When I start getting to the end, I want to slow down. Otherwise, I'm going to get a movement that's jerky at the end and sends it forward too fast. So once I get close and I'm almost through, I want to just take it really slow, but I'm still pressing down on the table. That's preventing it from bouncing. If you have a piece of wood that's stuck right here, Wait for the blade to stop and then use a scrap piece of wood to knock it out of the way so your finger doesn't have to get close to the blade. If you can cut both pieces at once, if you need two pieces, it's always a great idea to cut both pieces at once. So this is an example of an eighth grade and it's two supports. They're two scrap supports they're both long enough though, because I want it right here. Okay, I want it this long. So I just tape both of them together, go on like that, so I know the bottoms are nice and flat and flush. And then I place two pieces of tape and securely tape them together. However, I may not be able to fit this piece 
under my presser foot on any of the scroll saws. But I can spin it like this and that'll fit. But I can't really follow the line now. So I'm just going to bring that line around so that I can follow the line and fit it under my presser foot. Again, following all the safety rules of safety glasses, hair tied back, sleeves up, etc. Going to, I'm right handed, so I am going to put my um, right hand on the wood. I can't hold on with both because my left hand would be inside the circle. I don't want to hold it out here because that would bounce and I would have no control. But if I keep it just outside the round circle, then I know that I can press it down and stop it from bouncing while still keeping my fingers far enough from the blade. I'm going to back it up a little and I'm going to turn it on. Pressing down, feeling, um, feeling my muscle and my tricep working. Cutting just beyond the line. I wanna be able to see the line when I'm done. Making sure my thumb is outside of the circle as well. When I get to near the end, I'm going to slow down. Turn it off. Now these little pieces right here, I don't want to reach in, but I can just use my piece of wood, knock them out of the way, and knock them to the ground. If I thought that I made this a little too long, I could go to the belt sander and just sand that down. First though, this piece of wood is again, too tall to fit under my presser foot. So I'm going to have to move on to another machine. The best case scenario is to have your presser foot just slightly above this piece of wood because that's going to stop this, the bouncing of your wood. It's going to help you. So even though you're pressing firmly on the table, this is just one more tool to help it from bouncing. But you can't always find a scroll saw that's going to allow that to happen. Sometimes the presser foot is set up taller. This will still work. We just have to make extra, be extra careful in holding our wood down. I can't hold it with two, with two hands because while I can keep my right hand outside of the round circle, I can't keep my left hand outside. That's okay, I can hold it down with just one hand. Now, I happen to be right-handed, therefore, I'm going to hold it with my right hand. However, if I was left-handed and I felt I could have more control and more strength, I would hold it with my left hand. But of course, I would be keeping that left hand outside of the round circle by just a little bit. I wouldn't be doing this. This will be really hard to prevent bouncing. I won't have the same control, but, if I put it in closer, but just outside the round circle, then I'll have a lot of control. I'll stop it from bouncing if I press down hard on the table and my fingers will be far enough from the blade so they can't cut me. The line that I'm cutting on is right here. We wanna cut just past the line, just past the line. So I don't wanna cut my line off because that would actually make this too short. So this is the piece that's going to be scrap and thrown away. So I'm gonna go just past this line, just past it. So I line up my blade, then I back it up a little because I don't wanna start the machine with my wood touching the blade. I turn it on. Of course, making sure that I'm following all the safety rules of safety glasses, my hair tied back if it's long enough, tucking in anything that could get caught in this blade inside my shirt taking my sleeves and rolling them up to my elbow. My fingers are just outside the round plate. They're in a really good position to have good control. I'm pressing down hard. I can feel it in my tricep. I'm slowly bringing it in. When I get to near the end, I go nice and slow. I then turn it off. If there's any pieces of wood under here near the blade, I wait for it to stop and then knock them away right onto the floor, in fact. And in the end, I wanna be able to see my line. 
this scroll saw is really, really difficult to cut a straight line. So a lot of students will make this piece just a little longer and then go to the belt sander and sand it to length. Let's talk about the belt sander next. Now let's talk about how to sand with the belt sander. So in this case, I decided to leave a little bit of extra wood right here so that I could just sand to this line. It's easier than trying to cut perfectly with the scroll saw. With the belt sander, the belt is going to go in the downward direction once you turn it on. That means that this piece of wood is going to want to slam down to the table. So a lot of times, a lot of people will be tempted to sand their wood like this. That's, that's one of the dangers of using the belt sander. You're going to lose control of your wood because when you're sanding, it's going to go like this and it's going to want to slam down to the table. That's when you can get hurt. Therefore, always put it down firmly to the table. I'm going to show you what I mean. This is down at the table. If it's even at, if it's not firmly to the table, like there's some space here, then that's no good because there's this little space right here. And when you go like this, the piece of wood might want to get caught in there and then slam the wood up and then your fingers could potentially go into the belt. So flat down on the table, always flat. Never like this, never like this, flat down on the table. And then there's this groove right here. This is a great indication of where you should keep your fingers, right here. If you keep them too far back, then you tend to go like this with the wood, which is also dangerous. It's not no longer flat on the table. If you get too close past this little groove, then your fingers are too close to the belt and the belt is what can hurt you. The belt takes a tremendous amount of wood away and a really fast amount of time. So it is dangerous. If your finger touches the belt, you will get hurt. So therefore, keep your fingers right here. That's the best case scenario. If you have a piece of wood that is too short and your fingers need to be into the gold area to hold it, that piece of wood is too small to use the belt sander. Come see me, we'll figure out a different way to sand it. You may not sand a piece of wood if it's so short that your fingers can't hold it right here. So again, we never want to take the piece of wood and put it up against the belt and then turn it on. We always want to back it away first and then turn on the machine and then bring it into the belt. Let me show you. So on all of our belt sanders, the on off switch is to the right of the machine. So, of course, before I even start the machine, I'm going to make sure that if I have long hair, it's pulled back. I'm going to roll my sleeves past my elbow. I'm going to make sure that anything that's dangle is, dangling is tucked in, including ties to a sweatshirt, a necktie, a necklace, or even a bracelet. I'll have to remove that. Let me turn it on. I'm going to put my fingers right here. I always want to sand to the line, but not sand the line off. Just like when I cut, I don't want to cut the line off. That means that I've cut it too short. If I sand the line off, it means that I've sanded it too short. That's how to use the belt sander safely. If I need to sand two pieces of wood, it always makes good sense to tape them together. So make the bottom flush, and then tape the two pieces together and then sand both of them at once. That way I ensure they're both the same exact length. So this one is long enough because I can hold on to it right here and not go into the gold area when I'm holding it and still sand it. Again, I first line it up, but I don't put it up against the belt. It's flat on the table, not here and not like this. 
I turn the machine on, making sure, of course, that I'm wearing my safety glasses and following all other safety rules. I bring it into the sander. You might have noticed me moving it back and forth to different parts of the belt. The reason that I do that is because if you're sanding off a lot of area, this will get really warm and actually create a burn mark. So if you just get a, a little bit of relief by backing off and then going again, it'll stop it from creating a burn mark. But again, I never want to sand off my line. So right here, I can still see my pencil line. So I have created the exact uh, measurement that I need. If I sand it off the line, I would have made this too short. A couple more safety rules that I need to talk about. If you're waiting for a machine, then you need to stand behind this yellow line. So if somebody is in front of you using the machine, you're going to stand behind this yellow line. That's because you don't want to accidentally fall into them because they could get hurt. The last safety rule that I need to talk about is that you can only use machines that you've been trained on. So there are some machines in here that you'll notice that we have not been trained on. You are not allowed to use them. You are allowed to use the drill press, the scroll saw, and the belt sander. As you enter the room, you'll notice Towards the emergency exit, there is a cabinet labeled safety glasses. Inside this cabinet is where you'll find the safety glasses that you have to use when using tools and machines.